Uh, we are glad to be a part of the Chamber of RVA, but also to partner with the Chesterfield Chamber. As you all know, uh, the elections have consequences, and we want to make sure that we support those who are willing to serve. So thank you all for answering the call, but also those of us that are citizens. We have to make sure that we uh, do our job and participate in the process, too. So thanks for being here tonight. We look forward to this conversation. More important to election day. Thanks for letting me be here. Now tonight, we have a good turnout. I also want to thank um, the Chamber of Commerce, the Chesterfield Chamber, and the our friends across the river, Chamber RBA, for all their hard work and put this event on. We're very fortunate tonight to have Dr. Bob Robert Hosworth moderate our event. He's moderating tonight's event, and he's also going to be here next week for our school board candidates forum. That's uh, same place, same time, Thursday, October 24th. Um, as I said, Dr. Holsworth, we're very fortunate to have him. He is, without question, the preeminent political analyst in the state of Virginia. He is a former dean of the College of Humanities and Sciences at VCU. He uh, is the founding director of the L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs, as well as the Center for Public Policy. Um, he has done countless debates. He's moderated gubernatorial debates uh, that have been televised. He's done U.S. Senate forums. He's done many uh, mayoral contests in Richmond. So we're very fortunate to have him. I know Dr. Holsworth, I've known him for about 25 years. And I got my first taste of Dr. Bob in the early 1990s. I had the good fortune of taking a political science class at VCU that was taught by Holsworth and Don Baker, who is a longtime veteran political reporter for the Washington Post. And at the time, he was the Washington, Richmond bureau chief for the Post. Anyway, um, the class consisted of essentially every major state politician would come to the class and submit to an hour of interrogation at the hands of Holsworth and Don Baker. Um, so he knows what he's doing, and we're very lucky to have him. And with that, I'm going to pass the baton to Dr. Bob. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Can I be heard back there? This, this worked great. Um, there's no interrogation tonight. It's a forum, not a debate. So we're going to thank all the candidates for participating. And we're going to even ask the candidates to remember that it's a forum, not a debate, and try not to directly confront uh, the person next to you. And, uh, verbally or physically. <laughs> and so here are the rules of engagement tonight. We're going to have a 90 second introduction from each candidate. At the end, they're going to have 60 seconds for a closing statement. There will be 10 questions, full length questions, during the forum. And trying to ensure that we are able to get those 10 questions in, three of the districts will be asked to respond to each question. So they'll be rotating that all of the districts won't respond to each question, but I'll let you know who is going to respond to each question at the beginning. Now the questions will rotate evenly, so at the end, candidates from each district will all answer six of the ten questions. Each candidate, according to the rules, is also allotted one wild card. So if the district you get a question that you have a burning desire to answer, you hear a question and the candidates want to answer it, but there wasn't a question directed at their district. Once during the uh, forum, they will be asked uh, at the end of each question if they want to use their wild card on that. And um, that will be there. There will be a short lightning round midway through the forum to break this up. We'll have two questions that we're going to ask each candidate to respond to in 15 seconds or less. And toward the end, we have audience questions. There'll be a handful of questions that will be posed to everyone from the audience with 30 second response times rather than the one minute response time they're going to get to the questions during the majority of the forum. Um, so please get your questions ready. Uh, folks from the chamber, the Chesterfield Observer, are going to pick them up and hand them to me toward the end. Um, in making your questions, please make them general. Don't target them at one particular candidate because everyone's going to be asking them. So if you have an audience question, make it a question about Chesterfield or an issue in Chesterfield. Don't ask a particular candidate, why do you think this on that front? 
So let's get started right away, and I'm going to ask Mr. Bates to be, he can be the first uh, opening statement. Good morning. Good evening. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you to the Chamber for having this uh, host this uh, great event. Thank you to the Observer. Uh, my name is Jay Siddiqui. I'm running for the Board of Supervisors in the Midlothian District. I'm a product of Chesterfield County. I think that's first and foremost uh, what I'd like you to know. I grew up here in southern Chesterfield, so this is actually kind of coming home for me. Uh, it's a long drive down here this evening. I uh, went to school at Edric Elementary uh, at the time, uh, one of the, now still one of the most popular schools. Watoga Middle, Watoga High School, went on to BCU. Ended up with a biology degree, because in my community, you're in the you're three things you can be, a doctor, a lawyer, and an engineer. And in my junior year, I realized I didn't want to be a doctor, so I was stuck with a degree in biology, and I learned you couldn't do anything with it. Luckily for me, there was a shortage in teaching and sciences, so that's, that's how I got into education. I started teaching biology at Vanderbilt High School uh, in 2000, so I've had 20 years. What I really want you to know, I spent 20 years of my life dedicated to public education here in Chester County. The reason I'm running for Board of Supervisors is because our supervisors and our county administrator have devalued public education. Over the past four years, we've cut 10% funding. This disproportionately affects our highest achieving learners and our lowest income students. We must do better because education is the way we change a young person's trajectory. Thank you. Leslie Taylor, 96. Thank you. So I'm Leslie Haley. I'm currently the um, supervisor here in the Midlothian District, and I'm just finishing my first term on the board. And prior to my running for the Board of Supervisors, I spent probably 20 to 25 years actually in the community doing things like advocating for education, looking at ways we can improve education, ways like talking about SOL reform, talking about advocating um, for changes in our school. I, set, I served as the um, president of the County Council of PTA for four years from 04 to 08. I was involved on safe task force and other things like that, as well as involved within the village of Midlothian, the Midlothian community talking about renovations to fields, serving on foundations, serving within the community. So when the opportunity arose, for me this was more of a continuation of my public service. That's what it's really about. I live in this community. I really care about this community. And I want to make certain that as we advance this community, you know, I've raised my family here. My kids went through school, public school here. I want to make sure that we're advancing this community and we're keeping this community vital, keeping it vibrant, and getting the right mix of growth, the right mix of commercial, business, retail, residential, and caring about what this looks like in the next, for the next generation. Thank you. Mason. Good evening. My name is Shalon Mason. I'm running for the Matorka Board of Supervisors. I am from Matorka. My children currently go to Matorka schools. I also attended Matorka schools. I graduated from Matorka High School in 1993. From there, I went to the University of Virginia, graduated in 1997. From there, I went to the University of Richmond School of Law, graduated there in 2001, and also attended VCU School of Social Work with a Master's of Social Work and graduated there in 2001 as well. I have a law firm with Shawan and Mason PC, and they have been doing public service for the past 18 years. I uh, have a practice in criminal and family law, also serve as a guardian line for children. So it is something I'm always doing that's have very really passion about, and that's serving others and working for others. I will work with anyone, will collaborate with anyone. Um, I just have a desire to do what's right, and I thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Kevin Carroll. I'm also running for the Board of Supervisors for the Matoka District. I am not from Matoka, uh, although I've lived there almost my adult life. I'm a retired sergeant with the Chester County Police Department. Uh, in 1986, I uh, was offered a job to come down from Rhode Island, and it was um, really one of the best decisions I've ever made. Chester County is a, is a fantastic community, and I, during my course of uh, serving at you, um, you know, I, I worked in our Criminal Investigations Bureau uh, as a detective and as a sergeant and supervisor. I became president of the local Fraternal Order of Police here in Chester County for the president for 18 years. And then I became involved in the General Assembly as a lobbyist for the Fraternal Order of Police uh, in Virginia and the state president. Uh, so uh, we also got involved because of the lodge and local uh, things, uh, such as uh, supporting our kids at Christmas time, the Christmas Cop program. So I've been involved in the community. Uh, my entire career. Uh, very fortunate. I love Chesterfield County uh, and I want to continue to serve you 
I think it's a capacity and I can do very well for you. Um, I do believe in working across the aisle with other people. That's what I did in the General Assembly for years to make sure we got good legislation passed. Thank you. Give me right out. Good evening. My name is Tammy Rideout, and I'm from Chesterfield, Virginia. I've lived here most all of my life. I've been a hygienist and a um, business owner as well as a professor. I've also um, started out at Cloverdale High School and I also went to VCU School of Dentistry. As I was elected to the National ADHA Ethics Committee, I was elected to, the president of, to be the president of the Virginia Dental Hygienist Association, and I'm appointee of Governor Terry McCaughlin to the Virginia Board of Dentistry. As his appointee, I am sworn to serve the citizens of the Commonwealth and frequently apply my regulations and policy expertise. In addition to my profession, I served in many community organizations, including Caritas, Chesterfield County Fair, Fraternal Order of Police, and 25 years with the Boy Scouts. As your full-time supervisor, I will advocate for the needs of Chesterfield citizens and the business community in a transparent, timely, and consistent manner. I will be impactful, positive, and sustainable in the decisions I make when I build bridges with my various stakeholders. My vision for our future, and the Dale District in particular, includes developing a younger workforce to expand business growth. This will increase our tax base to provide for our school system, our public safety needs, services for our growing senior citizens, and maintenance of our county's infrastructure. Jim Holland. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank everyone for being here this evening. I want to thank the Chambers, as well as Bob, for a great, a great job, and the Observer, thank you as well for being here. Uh, I've been in Chesterfield County for 31 years in the Dale District. I'm currently one of the supervisors, but most of you haven't served my 12th year this year. Uh, I came to the county and was elected and led the county through the Great Recession of 2009, 2008. And today, Chesterfield County is a first choice community because we were there, and we are one of the best communities in the nation. I happen to know that from having attended NACO, where there are 3,069 communities or counties in the nation. Good things are happening in Chesterfield, and I stated in 2008, we're on a journey toward excellence, with our AAA bond rate that has not changed on my 12 years on the board. We deserve better, some say, well, better is that other counties want to emulate Chesterfield County. They want to know how we work so well together as supervisors, how we make great decisions, and of course, uh, as Dale supervisor, many people say to me, I feel safe in Chesterfield County. And they have because safety is a priority. They are, this is also one of the most desired communities to live in in the region, in the country for that matter. As Dale supervisor, I will listen and consistently advocate for policies that balance growth, that fund public safety, that fund public education, and transportation as well has been an issue. And as your supervisor, I will continue to listen to you. Thank you. Listen to you. Thank you. Chris Winslow. Good evening, and I want to thank the uh, Chamber, and I want to thank the Observer uh, for this uh, event, and I appreciate you all putting this on. Uh, I am lucky enough to be married to my wife, Kim, who is a senior audit manager at KPMG in these last 15 years. I have a son, uh, Joseph, who is going to be turning two in December, and a daughter, Kate, who is seven. She attends every elementary school. We are uh, blessed to live in such a great county, and I, I think that the entire ethic of public service in the Clover Hill District the last four years and in the future for me is I want to give back to Chesterfield as much as Chesterfield has given to us. And I think uh, as some of my colleagues on, on this uh, panel have mentioned, we have a lot to be proud of in this county. I'm a Navy veteran, uh, served in the United States Navy for eight years, and uh, there's a lot of good things that come out of military service. One of those things is leadership, and I've been proud to serve on this board these last four years because there's a lot that's been accomplished. Moving forward, there are three things we need to do, in, in my view, to make Chesterfield a better place. One, we need to solve a major maintenance issue in schools and get them to 2.5% BAGO funding. Two, we need to extend Poway Parkway to Hall Street Road. And three, continue to build on our high quality of life. Thank you. Deborah Gardner. 
Good evening. And thank you to the Chamber and the Observer for um, having us at this forum. And thank you for coming out to listen to us. It shows you care about your community. I have lived in Chesterfield County and in the Cobbeville District for over 30 years. Um, I have raised my daughter here. She actually is a product of public schools and just graduated from Monaghan High School and went off to Old Dominion University. I've worked in state and local government for 30 plus years. I've served at the helm of a state agency, um, the Commission on BASAC for 22 years, the Chief Deputy for the Department of Corrections, and the Chief Deputy for Criminal Justice Services. I have long experience in state and local government. I feel it is very important that as a community member, as a mother, as a homeowner, as a retiree, and now a small business owner, that we work and give back to our community. I think we have a growing county and we're growing more diverse and we need leadership that looks to the future. I think it's important that moving forward that we manage and do better planning with growth in our Chesterfield County. That we put our children first by adequately funding our schools. That we work to strengthen and revitalize our neighborhoods, especially in the Cloverfield District. We provide more access to transportation and that government is more transparent. I am proud to be a resident of Chesterfield County and I look forward to working with you. Jumingo. Good evening. I'm Jim Engel and I'm running to serve the Lamina District. I believe we need certain leaders that focus on quality of life issues like public safety, education, economic development, jobs, and the opioid crisis. I'm married to my wife Jennifer and we have two sons, one that recently graduated from Thomas Dale and one that's in the 10th grade at Dale now. I've been blessed to both live and work in the Bermuda District. I currently work for R.J. Smith as a uh, senior project manager and I have previous work experience in sales, estimating, purchasing, budgeting, project management, management, consulting, and I've owned my own small business. I have an associate's degree in business from Richard Bland College and a bachelor's degree in economics from William & Mary. I also served the community through the Boy Scout program, first as a Cub Master and now as a troop committee member. I've been a member of my church for the past 16 years, and I currently serve as a Sunday school teacher, an usher on the setup and takedown team, and also on the safety team as well. I've served as a volunteer at Bonaire Detention Center, working with young men for the last 20 years. But mostly, I'm just a normal guy that believes that working together, we can make a tremendous difference in the future of our communities. I look forward to your questions this evening. Thank you. Murray Kahn. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. I'm Murray Kahn. I'm running to be Bermuda District Supervisor. This community knows me very well. I stood with you all on the Megasite case, against the Megasite, a project that could not have brought return on investment to the community. I've stood with you on both the state and local levels of government. I've stood with you when you were worried about the quality of your drinking water. And, I've stood, and I'm standing with you now with your concerns on the Carvana case, which is coming up in front of the board next week. I believe in community vision. That's why I don't take contributions from real estate developers. Because currently, the way our system works is that we have developers that donate to Board of Supervisors. And shortly after, board members will vote on their cases. In the real world, we call this bribery, but in Chesterfield, we call it business as usual. I think that's wrong, and we can't have people voting on cases after taking money from someone who's making money on the case. I also believe that we need to understand that our servant leaders, will be, our actions and our words, have impact on the decisions people make. And as your supervisor, I always pledge to do the utmost right thing in encouraging our communities. We can't have people going into our elementary schools and telling crowds that former supervisors need to be shot and hung. That is inappropriate, and it is below the demeanor of what we need for a supervisor. I will never encourage violence, and I will always stand with you. Thank you so much for Thank you. We're now going to schools, location, and easy access to Richmond and nearby job centers. While the county is improving in terms of job creation, the local government is still heavily dependent on residential real estate taxes to pay for operations of 
future. How would you propose luring more tax generating businesses and jobs to Chesterfield County? And Kevin, your turn. So that's a good question. Currently, Chesterfield is third in the Richmond area. The right is 190,000 jobs, Richmond is 156,000, Chesterfield is 137,000. So what we need to do is, is create an environment for those, for those businesses who want to come and work here. And part of it has to do with the infrastructure to make sure that uh, there is infrastructure places for them to come and build a business. And one, of the, one of the projects to look forward to, perhaps, is putting the Poet Parkway in place, building an office park out there in the western part of Hull Street, and take some of those jobs. Imagine the quality of life if our people didn't have to fight traffic 288 north every morning and 288 south every evening to get back here. If we could bring some of those jobs over here, um, it would it would be much better for them. Uh, more time spent with your family instead of driving on the road. Anybody who lives out in that area of the county knows who's trying to get off uh, 288 in the afternoon is a nightmare. Thank you. Juwan Mason. More support to our local businesses. As a business owner, it's, it's, it can be very challenging um, to open a business, to start a business, and to have um, to be able to maintain your business. So more support to our local businesses. But also, in certain areas of the district, we're the largest district in Chesterfield County. We have 17 precincts. Um, there are certain areas where we need more resources for, for instance, our children that are graduating and those children who do not graduate and do need to have a GED. So make sure they're able to have some type of license, whether it's a vocational license, so they're able to get a job, so they can maintain housing and sustain, just sustain being able to live versus living the paycheck to paycheck. Thanks. We're going to go to the Bermuda District next, Jim Engel. We need to make sure that we speed the process up for businesses, make it easier and quicker for them to be able to get their businesses in place and get through the permitting process and get their businesses open. Right now that process takes longer than it should. Some businesses have actually started into Chesterfield County and after five, six, seven months of running into red tape have left the county without opening their business. Um, we also need to incentivize workers that are um, the over 100,000 workers that we send out of the county each day to other areas to look for a business closer to home so that they can have a higher quality of life, um, not spending so much time on the road. And I think if we can do that, we can show businesses that we have a higher quality of life in Chesterfield County so their employees will be happier and they'll want to come to the county. Very powerful. So the question I believe, I went, if I heard correctly, was both jobs and revenue, correct? Yes. Okay. So on the jobs portion, there's a lot of things that we can do better to bring good paying jobs into Chesterfield. We need to treat our small businesses um, well, not just our big businesses. Now, now when it comes to growth, you really gotta ask the community, how do you want to grow? Like with this Carvana case, the community is currently being told how they should grow and not being given enough concessions for them, for, for them and their community. So that's important as well. On the revenue side, we've cut millions of dollars in cash for offers, which were taxes that developers used to have to pay. And that's currently being indirectly shelled into your real estate taxes. It was said that when we cut the proffers, that this would lower the cost of housing. When the proffers were cut in half, the cost of housing didn't go down. It was said when we lowered the proffers that it was required by the General Assembly law. The GA law did make certain changes in how proffers could be issued. It did not require a cut in the same way we did. So we really have to look in the proffers as it relates to gathering revenue. Thank you. Uh, over here. Uh, so government's function is to create an environment where economic growth can occur. It's one of its main functions. Uh, what do we mean by that? Well, one of the things we've been doing in Chesterfield County is we have monthly business meetings with the community. We talk to people who are in business every month about their concerns. The chamber and other groups come and they offer their uh, insight into what is happening in the business community and what needs to change. One of the things we know that needs to change is the zoning ordinance. We are in the process of rewriting Chesterfield County's zoning ordinance really, really big deal and it will help us get over the hump. Regulation is also something that we're constantly looking at. Are our ordinances necessary? 
What can we change? These are the conversations that are ongoing monthly, and uh, certainly look forward to continuing this. Thank you. Deborah yeah, Carter. Over the past 3.5 years, the um, county has had very small to minimal, I mean, very small to zero growth um, in commercial income. As a matter of fact, in 2017, commercial income, the increase was almost zero. What I would do um, as a small business owner, I would work to make sure that the county is more um, responsive and more user friendly to um, get businesses to come. All too often, I've heard that we, when you're trying to start a business, I belong to a business networking group, that the process is so cumbersome, um, it's hard to navigate, and there's not anybody often for them to talk to. We need to be more proactive when it comes to working with smaller businesses because they actually have the backbone who brings jobs into the county. What I would do to help them succeed and thrive, I would have dedicated staff to help navigate and understand and provide assistance in navigating the process, such as licensing, such as inspections. All right, my time's up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone on the panel who would like to use the raises that came to Richmond a few years ago? A number of people also know, however, the county is uh, actively involved in a number of less visible but important projects with our regional partners. Do you think the county needs to be more engaged with our regional partners on regional cooperation? And if so, how? I'm going to start with Deborah Barton. Yes, I do think we need to be more collaborative. I actually worked as a Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for the City of Richmond and the Department of Human Services. And one of the things that we started to do at our level, the Human Service Officials, is to have regular meetings with Henrico, Chesterfield, and Hanover and do collaboration even though there was not collaboration at the top levels. We were able to get information passed, we were able to work and get a lot of things done. I feel like it's important that for this region to grow because Chesterfield County is considered to be a part of this region that we work together. We have issues around transportation, we have issues around um, jobs, and if we work more collaboratively we will be able to do that. I've worked through eight different administrations in state government. That means eight different governors, part Democrat, part Republican. And I think we need to learn how to work collaboratively, collaborative together, not just regionally, but across the aisle. Thank you. Chris Winslow. Uh, so currently we work uh, very collaboratively with, collaboratively with our partners in the region uh, through RPDC, through the Crater District and through the Transportation Planning Organization. In fact, we have been the most successful jurisdiction in the Richmond region when it comes to receiving smart scale dollars from the state's funding formula as it, as it pertains to regional projects. So when you look at the success that this board has had in uh, emphasizing those relationships, it's really been good. And looking forward, in order to extend the White Parkway, that's something that we're going to do down to Hall Street. We're going to have to have a strong relationship with our regional partners to make that happen. And I do believe that happening that should happen again because we need to relieve the 288 360 interchange, our number one transportation issue in Chesterfield County. Let's go to the Dale District for the first time and Tammy Ride up first. I believe in collaboration, communication, and coordination of all these different groups. We have lots of groups that we work with. Um, I'm an ambassador for the RBA Tourism, and I know we have um, we have the sports tourism, which is one of the biggest things going for us in this area. And Richmond is, and this area, the region, is full of history, and we need to cap capitalize that history and use it for more tourism dollars. In addition, we have, um, we... Jim Hum, thank you. First, uh, in terms of transportation, as a supervisor, I put forward a plan three years ago to connect GRTC on Jeff Davis Highway to Richmond so that it would make the, the three units connected in Ryco, Richmond, and Chesterfield. And that was about $500,000. I drew up a plan and worked on the plan and presented it. If I have many of you get to approve it, but we are working on a plan 
of some federal dollars for transportation uh, with regard to GRTC, which is critically important that we connect the region. And in terms of connecting and working with others in the region, we've done a tremendous amount. I've served, for example, as the chairman of the, of the Richmond Metropolitan Transportation Organization, which is an organization of 15 individuals, three to five from each district. As chair, we were working on transportation. Problem is, we need money. We don't have any money to make that happen. Uh, but we need to continue to focus on funding for transportation in the region. In addition, as my colleague stated, we meet every second Thursday with the Richmond Region Planning District. And so we meet there. We also meet with the airport as well. And as chair of workforce, we meet on that and the Richmond International Airport. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn to both of you now and Leslie Kelly. Thank you. So I think it is interesting that sometimes we get this bad rap that we don't really work together very regionally, but um, there's a lot of regional cooperation and discussion going on behind the scenes. That happens both from Richmond Regional Tourism, from the aspect of the involvement and the um, commitment that we all have to the Convention Center, the fact that we all integrate and talk together, as um, Mr. Winslow mentioned, um, on the Richmond Regional Planning District uh, Commission as well as the Transportation Commission. We all also contribute and have a seat at the Great Richmond Partnership that works collaboratively together on attracting and looking for economic development that can be, um, that will land anywhere in the region, but collaboratively we're marketing Central Virginia. In addition to that, certainly there are always outstanding questions that each of the districts face independently. And we talk about those independently. Sometimes we can't always reach the right conclusion or support each other at, at, at an initial stage. But we do have collaborative conversation. It can always be better, and I'm definitely for that. This is a huge area of improvement for us, an opportunity. Uh, I think of one opportunity of re recycling. Our current board of supervisors are prepared to cut the recycling program. If we would have retreated from the recycling program as a region, the recycling program would have failed because Chesterfield is one of the biggest sort of uh, contributors to this regional effort. But that's the issue we have with this board. They're not about playing nice in the region. Um, I was thankful to get Mayor Stoney's endorsement early on. He came out and was excited because he understands what my candidacy means for our greater region. When I think about transportation, specifically in the Midlothian district, there's we have buses running from Bonnie or Stony Point into the city, employment buses. They're packed, several routes. There is an appetite. We need to expand that route from Bonnie or Stony Point to Chester Town Center, from the town center down to the Stone Bridge. So folks can have access to health care and they can have access to employment. What we really need to do to get serious about it is we probably need to get the developers excited about transportation because they seem to be controlling a lot of what's happening on this board of supervisors. Our third question is going to go to Dale, Bermuda, and Matoaka, and Jim Holland, you're going to be first. Uh, from 2000 to 2015, according to the most recent census data, the number of people living in poverty in Chesterfield more than doubled. This rise in poverty has led to more economically disadvantaged students in our schools and is creating the need for more social service workers, public transportation options, and other services. What should the county do to address the growing poverty? Jim? Thank you. Well, we've done a lot already. First and foremost, I want to thank our committees on the future for creating a financial report which allows us to discuss poverty in Chesterfield County. It, it, and we've done a great deal on that regard. We've dealt with a lot of education. For example, at one of our schools that was challenged with uh, being accredited maybe 10 years ago, we invested over $2 million in that school. That school is now accredited in the Dale District and specifically. So we've invested in education. We've invested also, and we are invested, and I've been an advocate of investing in transportation as well. We need transportation along the Jeff Davis corridor into the Dale District, to the county complex for jobs, for uh, safety, for just a whole number of reasons. So we need to invest, we need to invest in education, uh, literacy, but also uh, financial literacy is another area that we work with our libraries to bring in families. We have a program called Fund, Families Understanding Numbers. Also, un the unbanked will work with them as well to have them bank and, of course, uh, handle their own resources. Thank you. Have you right out. The only way we're going to be able to tackle the poverty in Chesterfield County is business growth. The more people are employed, the more that we can get 
break the cycle. And right now, there are pockets in Chesterfield County where there are very little job opportunities. There are um, actually food deserts on Round 10 where we don't even have options for people other than one grocery store between Chippingham to um, uh, Iron Bridge and 288. So we need to increase the business growth with our work, younger workforce. That way we will give people the opportunity to be a hand up, not a hand out. And I think this will um, help us drive a bear affordable housing because it will give them the option of purchasing homes, particularly in the new house, new where new schools are, that seems to bring people out and make housing more affordable in those areas. Thanks. Go to the Bermuda District, Bernie Hunt first. So when we talk about poverty, this is a, an extremely serious issue in Chesterfield County. What are things we can do to help people who are in these situations? One, we need to do better with our public transportation, especially in our bus routes among the Jeff Davis corridor and other places in the county. We have a pilot program that's being set up, but that pilot program, there's no guarantee we're gonna get it more than, more than three years. So what happens at the end of that to all of those people? Are we gonna guarantee that we will continue to give them these services? Will we give it to them at a cheap, affordable cost? Because people who don't have cars can't afford large amounts of money to spend. We need to make sure that that stays that way and that we go even further in making it even cheap and even more accessible. We need sidewalks. People can't be walking down areas of Chesterfield and can't go to the store because there aren't any sidewalks. It's just wrong. And from the education standpoint, we need to make sure that all of our students feel welcome in our schools regardless of what background they come from or regardless of what languages they speak. Everyone in our school system, regardless of background, financial, security, needs to be treated equally in Chesterfield schools. Thank you so Thanks. much. Jim Engel. Unfortunately, this is a subject that I understand from my childhood. Um, when I was 10 years old, my parents divorced, and we were in a bad situation. What do we do about it? Well, we need to get to work with those in the community to give them more skills through job training programs, make sure there's work available for these individuals, and we need to revitalize the lower income areas of the uh, county, the Route 1 corridor, the Edrick area, and others, to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to succeed in our communities, and that everybody has an opportunity to have their dignity. In reference to the Matoka district, equity is a huge country. Equity, a lack of equity contributes to the, like the increase in poverty. Um, as a guardian item for children, I go to different schools in my district, and I know firsthand from what I see, there are certain schools, particularly in the southern part, Ettrick, um, if you go into their school, you will see literature that prones the children to be dependent, whereas if I go to different schools in the western part, there is literature in the schools that promote self-sufficiency. So one thing we want is equity within our schools, but we also want to promote for all of our children to become self-sufficient. Also to have more economic opportunities and also competitive wages in reference to our teachers, our firefighters, our law enforcement, so that persons will want to be a part of that um, employment. Thank you. Kevin Carroll. So I, when I was young, my parents got divorced as well. And uh, I know what it's like to stand in line to get milk and cheese. I did it. I've been employed since I was 14 years old. We need to create ways within our community for the young kids to get job training. We have a shortage right now in with plumbers, electricians, all of our trades are all short. We gotta make sure that our, our youth, as we're educating them, are getting jobs that can actually make money doing and getting trained out there. Uh, transportation is important. Um, and how we build Chesterfield County, we build it so big and so diverse, um, sometimes the jobs are not close. So there are issues on, on trying to get people close to where, where the jobs are. Um, and I, like I said, I think giving someone a job, getting the education, the training that they need, uh, that's going to be key in raising people up. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone want to use their wild card for the question? Uh, Chris Winslow. Thank you. 
Um, according to the Federal Reserve, actually our poverty rate in Chesterfield County in 2017 went down from 7.4% to 7.2%. I bring that up because what that means is approximately 700 families in Chesterfield are no longer living underneath the poverty line. That's, that's a good thing and we should celebrate that. And what I think that means is some of the barriers are starting to come down as it relates to building social capital in this county. What do we mean by that? Well, I think I grew up in a trailer park, first of all, in Gloucester County, so just FYI. We eat a lot of rice, and I even today I can't eat Uncle Ben's rice. It's just nasty. I can't eat it. <laughs> um, but I, 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 I firmly believe that the key to getting out of poverty for public policymakers is to encourage professionals like those you see on this stage and those of you in the audience to go and mentor to kids who don't see this side of the track to reach them, to talk to them, and to show them how you can reach the next level through hard work and diligence. And I firmly believe in the communities and schools that are in Chesterfield, and they do just that. Thank you. Uh, Leslie, you'd like to use your water card. I would, because I'd like to speak to this also. I think that it's really important to recognize that this board, from the very first um, time we sat and set our priorities, said two really important things, one of which was to invest in all of our citizens and give them the tools they needed to become self-sustaining and independent and to give them back their pride. And you see what we have done to that end because we've created a community enhancement department and we, in fact, are investing in our aging and older neighborhoods and we're setting the model. And we're setting that standard where rebuilding our older schools, we're building sidewalks and connectivity and reinvesting in government in those neighborhoods. And that is where affordable housing exists and that's where we can assist. In addition to that, I think that there's that mixed piece also that we have to make certain our school board is investing in our students as well. We, we five years ago, established the fact that we were going to invest in retaining reading specialists and also our tech center that is underserving that need. So thank you. Jim Holland, do you want to answer your wild card? Yes, I do. I want to thank you. I want to give some numbers as well. When we talk about poverty, I know accountability better than anyone on the stage. I've been born in Gates, North Carolina, uh, eating cornbread and peanut butter uh, at times. Uh, I know it well. Uh, with a mother with eight kids, my father died when I was 13, and we, she raised all eight uh, to go to college and to serve in the military to be a veteran. And let me just talk about jobs and workforce. As the second time as chairman of the Workforce Consortium for this region, I've served. We created jobs last summer. Over 90% of the teens in this region, that's nine jurisdictions, received summer jobs and internships. For the last five years, we're talking about jobs and work. Over 15,900 jobs were created in Chesterfield County, more than any other jurisdiction in the region. So we'll create jobs, and the key to create jobs is small business. And small business development is the way to do it. And that's the way you eliminate poverty through work, through education, and financial literacy, which is one of my pet peeves on the board. Financial literacy. Thank you. Rural populations, two thirds is the talking point they use. Two thirds of our population don't have kids in schools. Yet, with improved health care, we're seeing more and more grandparents engaging in a public education system. Because uh, our baby boomers and our seasoned citizens have a lot to offer our children in these schools. So, I do see that as a plus, not a minus, to, uh, to enriching the education of our students in Chesterfield. Also, uh, public safety, there's a huge impact, there's going to be a huge impact, and there is on fire and EMS with the number of calls, and we've seen that already in the last couple of years. We're building uh, a new Midlothian fire station, we're building a new Magnolia Green uh, fire station down there. Both of those very important and critical to maintaining our service uh, to, to our residents. Uh, housing, you've seen us approve 55 and up. UTs, first four masters that aren't necessarily 55 and up, and then offering uh, things in parks and recreation like pickleball, uh, Richmond volleyball, of course, and others. Thank you. Chairman Gardner. 
And one of the baby boomers, for those of you who don't know, I'm 63, so I'm fastly approaching that age range. I've actually served on the, um, as a board of directors on the senior, um, senior connections and I've done a lot of work working with the aging population. In Chesterfield County, we are aging and it is critical. I have to commend the, the current board and the um, county administration for um, having a program and having a person designated to just work with seniors. That's really important. We need to provide services to them. But secondly, I think it's important that as they age and they downsize, um, that we make sure there's affordable housing for them. And while we've had a lot of food plus, plus development going on, um, those houses are not really affordable. They start at the 260. And if you look at the report that was done on senior housing that was done by the uh, realtors, uh, affordable housing starts at 170. So we've got to do better providing housing that they can actually use as well as transportation. Thank you. We're going to go to the Dale District and uh, Tammy Wright. I also believe affordable housing is a big issue for our senior citizens. In fact, in the Dale District, uh, most of the housings for seniors are valued at less than $200,000, which means it's pretty impossible to move to a retirement development. Uh, all of the, the ones I've seen mostly are 300000 and up. Um, and the big, another issue we have is that we don't have enough fire stations. We had two on our list, but they've been bumped because their population is now the lowest, probably because we've had no business development in the Dale District for over 10 or 12 years, so therefore people are moving out. Um, when we don't have fire stations and they're taking 10 minutes to get there and 80% of the calls are for emergency services, that is a big impact on our senior community. In addition, um, we do have um, the demand on access, and I will say that our county has done a nice job of increasing that, and I hope we continue to increase that. But we do need to, um, I got it. Jim Holland, could you repeat the question, but we have comments all over the place up here. Okay. By 2030, more than 20 percent of the county's population will be over the age of 65. Today's wage will expect to increase demand for many county services. Meanwhile, those over 65 typically generate fewer tax dollars to pay for public services than younger people. What can we do now to prepare for the county's aging population? Well, thank you. We've already prepared for it, by the way. Uh, we've done a lot in Chesterfield County, such as having a senior advocate to utilize our seniors' time and effort. We have activity sums in every district. In the Dale district, we have a new recreational sum for seniors and youth coming online, $8 million investment uh, in the old Bureau School. Uh, we also have the Lifelong Learning Institute for seniors who can learn. Uh, Dale's uh, citizens go there. We're one of the only areas in the state to have one of the leaders in the state to have a senior clinician on their team, mental health, CSP, and social services. We have a very active senior population because they attend our parks and rec, our library system. They provide senior activities, senior education, and information. We have a senior passport. In addition, we need to utilize all of that time and knowledge that we've done and save millions of volunteer hours and dollars as they serve in public safety and education and all. Thank you very much. Is there anyone who would like to use their wild card for this question? Okay, thanks. We're going to go to question five. We're going to start with Bermuda. Jim Engel is going to be first. Then we're going to go to Matoica and Midlothian. Chesterfield Economic Development Authority is tasked with negotiating and promoting job creation. We spend substantial time attempting to lure new business to the county and recruiting businesses from out of state. Common criticized the EDA as lacking accountability and having too much power to spend taxpayer dollars. Where do you stand on the EDA's role in economic development and do you recommend any changes? I'm going to begin with Jimmy. Thank you for that question. Um, I do think that the EDA has had some cases recently, the past few years, that have not gone well throughout the county. We need to get ahead of that. I think the role of the EDA needs to be following the lead of what the county and the citizens want the EDA to go out and look for 
people. So what do I mean by that? For instance, the Carvana case. Obviously, the neighborhoods across the street from Carvana have not been happy about that case, but it's been zoned industrial for years. What we need to do is go out and identify those areas in the county. We need to work with the citizens that will be affected by those areas, come up with proper uses for those areas, and then direct the EDA to go out and to try to bring in businesses that fit that bill. Thank you. Very kind. So uh, we're working on the mega site case. We have a lot of experience with economic development for the Chesterfield. There is a clear lack of transparency. We asked last year, can you have these meetings recorded so citizens can see what the EDA is talking about, these public meetings that anyone can go to? Can we have it recorded so citizens can see what's going on in their neighborhoods? We were not granted that request. We have asked that the process with the Economic Development Authority become more transparent. On Carvana, the reason why there's an issue, no one has built on that property for more than 30 years since it's been zoned. And now we're saying all of a sudden that if we don't do the zoning right now, that someone's going to build on it tomorrow. I don't think that's a, I don't think that's an accurate argument. With the EDAs, we need more community involvement. We need people on the EDAs who represent communities and not just certain sectors of the of the business community. And we need a more transparent process. And until that comes, I don't think we need to be giving the EDA as much money as we're currently allowing them to use in the county zone. I think that the, the county certainly needs to do better in transparency when it comes to the EDA. Um, I, I think that uh, what Jim touched on, and actually what Chris touched on earlier, the kind of the process of looking at our zoning ordinance uh, comprehensively to, to, to rewrite it to make it more business friendly. But in the case of uh, the Carolina case, we did have a zoning case that was pending out there for 30 years. And when the residents moved in, they didn't know about it. So we need to inform people a little better uh, and again, encourage the EDA once we have public hearings uh, to go out and find businesses that would be more appropriate to have on these, uh, these different building lots that are available throughout the community. But I really think transparency is, is key. I, I think that's part of the problem why we have such a bad perception with the EDA right now because people look at it and say, we're not getting the information, they're not telling us what we need to know. So working with the community better uh, to, to, on these projects, uh, I think is important. Thank you. Juan Mason. I agree, I think that transparency and accountability is key in reference to the, the Economic Development Authority. One thing that I will add, speaking with our neighbors, there's a big concern that their voices are being ignored and that other outside interests have more influence. So in most of these instances, it's really important to get the feedback from the citizens ahead of time before decisions are made. Leslie Taylor. Thank you. So I think, first of all, there seems to be, Pam, I'm going to ask you if you like to turn that off because that light is very distracting to me. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I think there's a lack of uh, understanding sometimes about this distinction between our economic development department and our zoning department and work, but thank you. And our economic development authority. So the authority is actually a number of folks who are appointed to the economic development authority, and they do things like, for instance, purchase the property at the old Cloverleaf Mall, and actually that or the Meadowville area. And when you look at the return on investment that we've gotten out of those properties, Meadowville alone has turned over $455 million in new capital to the county. So those monies, that's separate and distinct from projects like Carvana that come in as an actual zoning case that go through planning, economic development may get involved with, but that, those issues get handled separately. And one thank second you. for that. Well, well, thank you. So I think it's really important that you look at the distinction there. But our economic development authority, by nature of what it's doing, we're attracting business interests. We're trying to work to bring new investment, new business that you've heard from the whole group tonight. We sometimes can't be all that transparent because businesses aren't that transparent about where they're looking for investment. Thank you. Uh, debate speech. Thank you. Um, I'm 
Yeah, I would agree with uh, the that was some of the comments here. I think the meetings need to be recorded. I think there is a lack of transparency generally that comes with government authority. Uh, I think when I'm the door knocking and having community meetings, what I hear from citizens uh, to that public spaces point, the folks in my community don't believe that the current board really cares what they have to say. Those decisions have already been made and these decisions are going to happen. They're going to happen to us. We're being told what we need. And I think if you really unpack the campaign contributions, the decisions sort of speak for themselves when you follow the money, who's really influencing the decisions in our community. And I think we as an individual citizens have to organize, we have to come together, we have to demonstrate to our larger county that we actually care to have a voice, and I would like to see our voices heard. Does anyone want to use their wild card uh, for this question? Okay, thanks. We're now going to go to a very quick lightning to a lightning round where I'm going to ask uh, two questions. And the first question, we'll, I'll start with Jamaica Sadiqi, and you can answer yes or no, but in no longer than 15 seconds. The Board of Supervisors recently approved the first full service bus line along the Jefferson Davis Highway. Do you support expanding full service bus lines to other parts of the county? My answer yes, since I spoke to this earlier. Yes, to the extent that we can do studies and, ma and maximize that use. It depends on the needs of our citizens and what our citizens are asking for. Uh, yes, I think we need to look at it as an option because of how density is about the county. Yes, but only after we have looked and seen what the results are from the Jefferson Davis to make sure that it's fiscally sound and a smart decision to make. Yes, because we need to accommodate our seniors that we mentioned earlier. They need transportation to and from. Also, especially the Jeff Davis Corridor, which I've always, always said for the last five or six years. And certainly, we need to think about transportation in the future and find ways to fund it as well. Thank you. Uh, yes, depending on the results of studies uh, from DRPT, our own staff, and Others, uh, as we did with our extension on Jarrell Line. Yes, if it meets the needs of the citizens, if the routes don't work for them at the times that they need them, it's not very cost beneficial. Yes, in the areas that the ridership will support it. Yes, we already know where the bus lines need to go. It would be a small portion of our budget to allocate more funding towards bus lines, a very small portion, and it will change people's lives in the future. It will change people's lives. Thank you. The second lightning round question goes first to uh, Bernie Pond. A voter referendum to implement a 2% meals tax primarily to pay for school construction was defeated in 2013. One was approved in Henrico County and they received sufficiently uh, uh, cents of dollars for school construction. You support another referendum for a meal tax? The community needs to decide, and they need to decide how they would want that referendum to go forward. I'm personally against it, but I am for the community having the opportunity to make that decision. Yes, if the community decides, and if the funds are dedicated to a specific need, such as education, not just the general fund. We're concerned about that. I mean, just, just see you know what's going on here. Um, the, the answer is yes, I would vote to put a referendum on the meals tax because it will coincide with the bond referendum, which we don't have, and I would limit it to education and public safety. Yes, I'm the supervisor who made the motion to put it on the ballot in 2013 and laid the was comparing the board for 4% and only to get 2% because we had someone on our board who didn't agree with that. We would have have $110 million if my recommendation had been taken. In 2013, you would have a maintenance issue. You would have two schools. And we sold it for education, by the way, too. Yes, I would also um, agree to do a um, meals tax as an employee of the citizens. If the citizens request it, then I will make sure that it's used appropriately. 
for school funding and public safety? I don't personally um, want to see a bill stack, but that's just me. However, it's not up to me, it's up to the people. So if the people want to put in a referendum and the money's going to be designated specifically, like they said, for public safety and the schools, then I would vote to push it forward for the people to vote for it. It depends on the input of our citizens if they're in favor of it or not, and also what the data shows the pros and cons of the meals tax. I would support putting meals tax on the um, ballot referendum to support schools and county uh, capital and construction. I absolutely would support the meals tax, and I would support it only for public education. I'm glad to hear my opponent that she seems to be for it one audience, not a bit of an audience. Bottom line is that we know we need funds for public education. We have to get serious. Without the meals tax, we're not going to be on needs. Now, with that, go live on this. I'm sorry, I wasn't in 2013. Thank you. Now, we're going to go to the question of the state. We're going to start with Republica and move on Mason. As the county continues to grow, and then we're going to go to Midlothian and Dale. As the county continues to grow, both residentially and commercially, this leads to more traffic, more homes being built, more land being developed. How do we work to protect Chesterfield's natural resources? ensure a clean, sustainable future for its residents. And Shawan Mason first. Well, first, balance. Whenever there's a, an applicant or a project that is, that is suggested, having the appropriate research as far as the resources, how the project will impact our county, particularly the Victoria District. But whenever you're dealing with the environment, always consult a reference to the EPA. Again, it's, a, it's about balance, about striking a balance between what the community needs. Uh, when you look at um, the large growth we've had, uh, it has affected our green areas. So moving forward, you know, when you look at these cases, um, we really have to look at what it's going to provide to the community, how it's going to enhance the community. Uh, we still uh, need to, in my opinion, keep farmland, uh, places for people to hunt and enjoy the outdoors in Chesterfield County. That's part of our heritage, part of our culture. Uh, I'm a big hunter. I love the land that we have here. Uh, I'd like to make sure that we keep something available for our young kids to enjoy in the future. Uh, yes, I would uh, start with regarding for protecting our land. Uh, this current board of supervisors took land off of CTC Hall by uh, the school uh, adjacent to the reservoir without any engagement with the school system. So I think, one, we need to be thoughtful about where we put things like a fuel station, not on our uh, precious water resources, because we're honestly a big water source. In uh, regards to uh, bike, bike trails, uh, bike lanes and, and trails, I've been all in favor of all this. I'm hearing a lot from our community. They'd like to see greater access to bike lanes and also trails. So these are things that I think our Midlothian community hears. What I'm hearing from our Midlothian community, what I'm not hearing is they want this Midlothian plan on, uh, placed upon them. Well, it's a very interesting conversation because the Midlothian plan is actually designed to meet all of these needs. What the Midlothian plan is designed to do is actually control growth. It's actually designed to define what that growth looks like. We're growing as a county at about just over about 1.3%. That's a very healthy growth rate. We don't want to be declining. And so the question is then how do we make sure we can take that growth rate in a, in a specific way? And it also includes all of those aspects of connectivity walkability, bike trails, all the things our citizens are asking for. It also has some very good restraints about the environmental issues regarding how we um, make sure we're managing the stormwater all through there. And you know, we're sitting as a county in such a fabulous place with a water authority that is triple, triple A bonded water authority. So we've protected that investment pretty well. But I think without a plan, without a comprehensive plan like we have and the Midlothian plan like we have, then you have them control growth. Two comments. Yeah, thank you. Smart growth impacts our quality of life. It's very important that we plan, that we follow a comprehensive plan. We plan well, but we follow a plan in our zoning and zoning cases. It's critically important because uh, what we found out back in the 80s, the county grew fast, tax rate is a dollar and seventy cents per hundred foot, and you say that's a dollar and seven per hundred foot. Today it's ninety five cents. So we've grown smartly over the last few years. We preserve farms. We have farms in the Dale district for the reason I preserve. So we have done I think well in terms of having a plan that I worked on July 2012, 2017, 
to make sure you kind of grow to a moderate rate as my colleagues make it three or four percent for a year and then we don't overtax the resources our schools our police our fire and yes uh, with a smart plan and so it's critical for important that we do that and that we prioritize uh, growth prioritize where our commercial base is uh, impacted by growth throughout the county particularly in the larger areas such as uh, uh, Thank you. Tammy, right after. Uh, Chesterfield is large enough that we should be able to meet the needs of all our various types of residents, which means those that want to live on a farm, we should still be able to do that. Those that want to live in a suburban neighborhood, we should be able to do that. We have millenniums coming out here that are, there's twice as many of them as there are of us baby boomers, Debbie, believe it or not. So they're going to be out there and they're going to want high density housing. They don't want to have to drive to the grocery store. They don't want to drive anywhere. So we need to be able to have projects very similar to the one in Hillington that Leslie was talking about that has the, gives us the opportunity to make the most of the space that we have that's there. And also we need to make sure that that um, high density subdivisions or whatever um, do not put strain on our other resources. And I believe that's what they did when they did this long-term project. So we need to look out further than the comprehensive plan because the comprehensive plan is not very comprehensive. Anybody want to use their wild card? Deborah Gardner. Yes, I believe that our county is growing and I think growth is good. But I think that we need to better plan for our growth. I think we need to consider the um, our natural resources. I think we need to be more considerate of the needs of the communities instead of just the needs of special interests. I think we need to listen more to our citizens when it comes to the growth and make sure that the growth that's happening will complement the communities that are already there by providing amenities to our older neighborhoods and help with the revitalization. I think we need to make sure that we have an excuse but that we don't get so caught up into the density. While I, I believe baby boomers may want that as um, the person who lives in their forever home, I'd like to have green space. I'd like to have walking trails. I'd like to have sidewalks. I think that improves the quality of life for all of us. So while I believe we should have growth, I think we should be, have well-planned and more responsible growth and consider the needs of the citizens when we're doing that. We're going to go to question seven now, and we're going to start with Bermuda and Hermie Pond, go to Clover Hill and Matoa. And this really extends upon the theme we've been talking about for in a number of the questions. How do you balance the need to increase the tax base by luring more economic development, such as the proposal for what's new in South Chester, with the desires of residents who find the county attractive because it's such the quality of life of the Urban bedroom community. What's your what's your response? Well, both, both or start the timer. This development in South Chester. You're talking about the mega site. Yeah. Mega yeah. site. Yeah. Okay. Start the timer. Or or or, or the currently planned development. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. So, um, feel free to start. Um, but um, with, with with this is actually a very good question. So when we look at development, you'll find that residents are lots are, are very smart. They know what's good in their neighborhood, and they know what isn't good in their neighborhood. On the mega site case, we were told you either get this mega site or you get all of these homes. Well, we said we didn't want either of those, and now we're getting the solar home. On the Carvana case, citizens put forward very basic concerns as to what they wanted. Those concerns have not yet fully been listened to. They said, hey, there's certain things we want. So when you balance growth and development, you really gotta ask what residents want. And we had a good system of paying for it before we cut it in half. It used to be that when a developer built in Chesterfield, they pay for the cost of their growth through cash proffers. They don't do that anymore, and instead we have this practically being shelled on the real estate burden. People are paying some of the highest real estate tax taxes they've ever paid in their lives right now. And so it's important to ask people and to keep in mind that when going through this, we had a system before that we can use again and even expand upon. Jim Angel. 
it's important that we get ahead of some of these cases. With Carvana in particular, again, we had an area that's been zoned industrial for some number of years, and we didn't work with the community to come up with it, to come up with best use of that property and then go back to the EPA and try to recruit businesses that would work well with our vision. And that's what we need to do. We need to identify the industrial areas and the residential areas. We need to identify the uh, high use commercial areas that are near residential areas, work together with the citizens, come up with what we believe would be the best use in that area, and then go forward and look for uh, projects that will meet that criteria. Mr. Clover Hill and Deborah Barnett. Question again. Sure. Um, how do you balance the need to increase the tax base by luring more economic development, such as the recent proposal for South Center, with the desire of residents who find the county's quality of life so attractive to want to remain a suburban veteran community? Um, I, I first think transparency and community involvement, because I think some of the issues that we've come against up in Chester County recently is because the citizens feel like they are not being told what's happening and they wake up one day and there's development coming in their community and they don't really know about it. I think the county needs to develop better ways of involving the community. Um, just putting a sign up saying, come to case number X, Y, Z, and people, some people don't drive, some people don't want to have that. So I think we need to have community education programs when it comes to development. Because if you get buy-in from the community, then they're less likely to be against it. Having them come to a public meeting and get three minutes or three minutes just before the vote and call that public input is not working for the majority of the community. Chris Winslow. Thank you. Uh, so I think the first thing to, to state on this is that we have a comprehensive plan for a reason. And so those residents who currently exist in Chesterfield County can always look at the comprehensive map and see what exactly is going on next door or down the road and um, uh, develop an expectation as to what should and could and you know may be there at some point in the future. So it's important that we continue to go through our comprehensive planning and what as we do every five years of course we just passed that. That was a very extensive community conversation. There were a lot of meetings across the county and uh, we felt like we did a very good job with that. The other thing to say is that for every case that comes before the Chesterfield County Board of Supervisors, it, it goes through the Planning Commission, of course, and there is no state requirement to hold a public meeting, a community meeting on these cases, uh, the developers or the landowners, there's no requirement. Yet we do that anyway, sometimes multiple times in these cases. And we don't even know that. We go above and beyond. Uh, we we'll move to Kevin Carroll. Uh, Chris Wright, the comprehensive plan is in place. It's online. Anybody can pull up and look at it and see what's in, what's in the plan. Uh, and when they had the public meetings recently, you had an opportunity to go down and voice your opinion uh, and look up what actually is perhaps proposed in the area where you live. Um, but community engagement is extremely important. And so sometimes we need to reach out and the county does do a good job of that. Can we do better? Of course we can always do better. No matter what we do in government, we can always do better. But community engagement is important. Uh, and communication, uh, making sure that the, the public is in fact informed. Uh, and then, you know, we can't build up these people who want to come here and actually spend money to make our community better. Right? If you do that, they're going to go build a power camp. They're going to do it somewhere else. We have to work together with the development communities and the comprehensive plan and the people to effectively do this. And that's how we'll be able to manage growth in the future. In the Matoka district, it is very diverse. Um, you have one part that's very lucrative, and you have one part that appears to be somewhat impoverished. In essence, for Matoka, one size does not fit all. And so it is important for our citizens who currently are residing in the areas to be aware of what's going on and not to have things forced upon them. But there is a duty on the citizens 
And recently, we've attended, I know Mr. Kerr was there too, meetings in reference to our fire station that we have in the building in Torka. They had two community meetings. It wasn't a lot of people who were there. And so there are times where the information is there, but we have to make sure that our citizens, you know, when it comes to the meetings, and so that is also something to be considered. First of all, you want to increase the tax base. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 I I totally believe that we can have a nice increased tax base, but also make our citizens happy. And the only way we're going to do that is to be transparent. Um, an example was this last case that one of our supervisors was bragging about it was going to be pushed through and we were going to be getting this just a bill landing. It was going to be fast tracked through. Well, that is not what makes people happy. They want to have input. And if you give people the, input, the chance to have input ahead of time, they are going to want to buy into the um, project. But you got to have all the facts laid out. Seven, Seven months to get a site plan is a long time for somebody that's building a project. So we need to make sure that we can streamline these projects once we decide that we're going to agree to do them and make sure that they can get up and running faster. The faster we get that tax dollars, the faster everyone will be happy and we'll be able to meet their infrastructure needs. The next question uh, goes to Midlothian, Leslie Valley Bird, Gail Clover Hill. Addresses a, a particular issue that has been raised a couple of times during the uh, during the comments here. Earlier this year, county officials rolled out the Midlothian Community Special Area Plan, a planning guide that calls for more housing density, more pedestrian friendly amenities like sidewalks and bike lanes, and urban style precincts. Some in the community, however, view the plan as a guide to overcrowding the county's roads and schools. Do you support the Midlothian Special Area Plan? Why or why not? And let me have a Thank you. And so the Midlothian Special Area Plan has been about three years in the works. We went out to the community three years ago and started the conversation at many more levels than we ever did in the past with rotaries, with business clubs, with women's clubs, every place we could get into a homeowners association. And we said, what's important? What do you love about Midlothian? What would you change? And then we brought that back when we started to develop this plan. And it's not my plan. My opponent keeps referring to it as not, not my plan. It's the citizens' plan. And we're continuing to tweak this plan as we hear from the citizens. But here's why I do support a plan. And when we get there, it's going to be a great plan. And that's because we have to have some kind of controls on what new development looks like. New development's coming. We know it's coming. We need to have the controls. And we need to be able to integrate into that the things we heard from citizens. Walkability, connectability, pedestrian friendly, owner owner occupied to some extent, reinvention of the of our older um, shopping plazas and things, and that's what this plan brings. Basically, I to be clear, the citizens I speak to refer to this Leslie's plan because they have not had their voices heard. Let me give you one example. The first meeting, I uh, took a text message. I was out of a baseball game, and uh, the school official said, "Why are you at this meeting?" So when we got this church, 15-ish people attended. Within a week, we had our own meeting, the school system, because of the impact it was going to have on the overcrowding of the school. Over 200 people showed up on the e email. The next meeting that this county had, those same 200 people showed up at Lindley Baptist Church. They're concerned about this plan. They don't like what they're seeing being done to them. They want to have a voice. I can tell you right now, we redistricted for the new old hundred that the school board fought hard to open early to lay the overcrowding of block as we pull 400 kids out of that school. The developer said, well, there's 400 new seats there. What he didn't understand, what Mrs. Haley doesn't understand, is those 400 students were sitting in 18 trailer classrooms. The entire fourth and fifth grade of Watkins were in trailers. Those students will go back to trailers with this development if this comes online right now because there's been a lack of, a lack of thoughtful development. Let's go to the Dale District, Tammy Ryder. I believe that this project is a good project. I don't think it's through its 
Um, I'm sure there's some areas that need to be tweaked, but we have to realize that air, as our seniors decrease, I mean, as our senior population increases, we need to get as many millennials to stay in Chesterfield. We need that workforce. We need those people here. These young people want to live in these high density areas. They want it walkability. They do not want to drive a car to the restaurants. It has to be right there at their fingertips or they're not going to want to live here. Do I want to live in a high density area? No. I like being in my little neighborhood. I don't care to have a sidewalk. It doesn't bother me. But we need to look and realize that we need the workers here, the jobs here, to increase our tax base so we will not be taxing our individual cities, citizens on real estate taxes. And the only way we can do that is to encourage these mixed developments with some high density housing. But we also need to make sure we meet our public safety needs. Oh, yeah. Uh, in our fields there. In addition, we want to talk about the tax base and quality of life. Look at him rank up. They have a 70% residential, 30% uh, business. Chesterfield, about 70% uh, residential, 22% business. We need to work on small business, increase the tax base to be around small businesses because that's where the money is. That's where the economy is most impacted by small businesses. We can do a better job and I see how small businesses are over there assistance in the audience. So we got to work on that. And that's one thing I started on, by the way, yeah, years ago. I'm going to have to cut you off there. Chris Winslow from Clover Hills. Thank you. I think uh, one of the most important things to talk about is where does density go in Chesterfield County? Where do we build it? And if you look at Smart Growth America, ULI, all of the people who studied this and have done this, the professionals who work on this issue, decades all say the same thing and that is that where we have major intersections and where we have towns or villages that is generally where density should go some density and so the question is we hear from rich group association realtors we need more housing stock in chesterfield county a more diverse housing stock so it seems to me that there are some really positive elements in the midlands and special area plan Ms. Haley mentioned walkability, big deal. We, we, uh, we absolutely have uh, placed an emphasis on that in Chesterfield and added 15 miles of sidewalk in Chesterfield County in fiscal year 19. In addition to that, planting trees. In addition to that, the types of construction materials. And I'm going to have to cut you off on that. Deborah Gardner. because we're about to freeze to death. <laughs> I hate to say that. Don't count that as my time. <laughs> I thought somebody might just turn the air down. Um, anyway, I actually um, have reviewed the plan. I actually sat in on the um, planning commission meeting when it was brought up. I sat in on the board of supervisors meeting. And I have concerns with it because you had an inordinate amount of citizens who had concerns with the plan who actually live in Chesterfield and were, I mean, in the Bloomington district and was concerned about the input that the citizens had into that. I, I understand it's been a plan that's been on the table for a long time, but sometimes when you do that, you forget to come back and review with the people who are involved. I think it's important to have a plan when you're working on growth, but some of the concerns that I have with this is just like everybody else is the citizen input, is the increased congestion with the transportation, is the increased strain on the schools and the public safety, and as well as there's some concerns about the, um, the connection, and we have done that for the last several years. In fact, tomorrow morning I have a meeting at J. Sauter Realms just to do just that, is work on workforce development. Carrie Ryder. Um, I, I have to disagree with Mr. Holland. Um, if you attended a lot of the chamber meetings, you would know that we have a one thing called Chesterfield Chamber Champs, and that's just one of the areas that we um, that I'm a part of. That we go out and try to mentor the the uh, young juniors and seniors with junior scholastics. But um, having more business and the Chesterfield Tech Center working together so that we change the tech prop 
programs to meet what we're going to need in the business community. This way we will be able to employ youth when they get out of school and they'll be able to have more um, internships and possibly get scholarships from their employers. We're, get, we're going to be about to the point where we're going to lose a whole generation of no skilled workers because several years ago we were pushing everybody to go to college and now the population that is in trades are leaving. So in about 10 years from now we are going to be in a, in a real bad situation unless we continue to do alliances with businesses in our school. Thanks. We'll move to Bermuda and Jim Engel. Again, I agree with uh, Tammy that we need to partner with our businesses to uh, bring programs into our schools and into the community college to build workforce skills for those um, businesses so that we can prepare our citizens to be able to go to work for them. But I also think that we need to work with our trades, um, plumbing, HVAC, electrical, um, the masons, to do more workshops and to get some of our high school students that may not be college bound into a track that will help them to prepare for a future in one of these trades. Because these trades are dying right now. If we don't bring some younger life into it, we're not going to have anybody to build our schools, to build our communities. So we need to get them involved. Bernie Pump. So when I served under Secretary of Commerce and Trade, Todd Haymore, I quickly learned that one of the most important things is workforce development. When businesses move in, they look at that almost on top of practically anything else. It is of crucial importance, and we need to make sure that our students in our schools are properly trained for the jobs of the future, not just the jobs of today. However, there is also a concern that we need to address in this. We need to make sure that while we are addressing this and training students for the jobs of the future, we need to also make sure that private interests aren't dictating educational <laughs> initiatives. That needs to be done um, it needs to be done in a way that's planned, but private sector cannot dictate educational initiatives. And I'm honored to have the recommendation from the Chesterfield Education Association Fund Committee. And I will work with the schools to make sure that they are able to dictate the initiatives, but workforce development is of utmost importance. And we need to train people for the jobs of the future, and it needs to be done in a way that the community approves of, the, of, of our educational initiative, community and parents. Thank you so much for your time. The workforce development is key. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a guardian item. I know Leslie's a guardian item too. And there is a small percentage of children that you are not going to find in statistics that do not graduate. Um, they do not have a GED, and yet they are reproducing. And so, as a result of that, um, I have actually a nonprofit it's called the Family Life Center. And with that, there's Hope Builders United. The purpose of that one is we focus on education. The second aspect is employment, and the third aspect is housing. And so there is a connection, and they all go together. And so developing a workforce is also key. And then to add to that, I have a niece that is 22, and I'm not sure what the mindset of the young folk these days, but when I grew up, you know, education was key, going to college, getting a job, that type of thing. But it seems like some of our young folk are kind of lackadaisical, and I think some of that goes with the households. And so we really need to push, you know, our young folk to be motivated, and not just to get a job, but to have a type of a employment that will give you a career so that you can maintain housing and sustainability. Thank you. Kevin Carroll. <clears throat> well, workforce uh, development is, is, is key. Working with the schools to make sure that the programs that are in place. However, we kept the county actually made a policy to cut the profits in half and just to use it for transportation. Yeah, we're still giving a whole lot of waivers to people. We kind of allow people to get grandfathered in under the old law and not have to pay. So one of the ways that I would look at is looking at revisiting the proper, proper policy and using some of those additional funds. We need to get more involved. I think the county already is with matching funds from VDOT and get into those programs as well and really aggressively get to get those matching dollars, but I do think we need to revisit the proffers um, policy and see about getting money because that's where the transportation stream is coming from with the development. 
Chris Winslow. So I think that's correct, sir. I think it was stated earlier, we don't currently charge a residential proffer or request of rent. That's incorrect. We, we have a $9,400 transportation proffer, and uh, in the last fiscal year accepted uh, just over $4 million in, in, those, uh, in those types of uh, funding, and all, again, all went to transportation, and it went to a match funds from the Commonwealth. So, so that's, that's one piece of it. Um, the other piece is, in, in cases where we did not accept actual cash from developers, we did have $54 million in on-the-ground road improvements uh, that were put there a lot faster than we would have been able to as a county. We are also in the process of rolling over our, uh, the second half of vehicle registration fees into county transportation. That will be complete, I believe, in two years from now. And then we've been very aggressive and very successful, as mentioned earlier, in the smart scale process. Uh, again, more successful than any county or city in the Richmond region. They're all mad at us, and CTB changed the rules when we were very successful in round one and two. Yeah, I would uh, echo a lot of what uh, Deborah said. I think we should revisit the proper policy. Uh, this county, after the change in law, they decided to uh, retroactively apply the policy to developers that were in the queue, which forfeited millions millions of dollars in lost revenue that could have been applied to a host of projects, about certainly roads. I think what I would like to see is I would like to see a better working relationship with developers. We want, look, we want developers to win. They're not going to develop if they're not going to make money. But we have to, we, the citizens, the taxpayers, have to stop losing. There can be a win-win relationship, and that's what I think I'll bring to the table, is really working aggressively with our developers to ensure we're all parties, both sides, citizens and developers, are winning. Well, well, I think the first thing is you have to understand what the profit policy was and what we gave up. I mean, we really didn't give up anything. We actually gained by implementing the uh, $9,400 transportation policy. Because the profits are a one-time sum. And when you look at the monies that we've actually collected over the course of that, the in-kind transportation monies of $54 million exceeds what we would have ever collected in profits from those projects. In addition to which, development has come along on properties where we have continued to collect on an increased residential base. So in other words, for instance, a property that might have had $179,000 tax value is now worth $79 million, and we're collecting $750,000 every year in tax revenue off that property. So you can't look at an isolated number and say we've lost. But for road infrastructure needs, we're actually getting money, boots on the ground, roads done quicker and more affordable as developers are paying for that in advance. We're going to go to Bermuda and Bernie Hunt. So I've already covered proper, so I won't go too deeply into that portion of this. Now, in Chesterfield, it's very interesting when you go to places, and there are certain places that the roads are very nice, and there's other places that you go that roads have been struggling for years. And, you know, that's a shame. Now, we can make a plan, but a plan isn't the same as doing something. So, when, when, once we get into the Board of Supervisors next year, once I get into the Board of Supervisors next year, I think we need to look at our more than $700 million budget. We need to look at what places have struggled the longest on our roads. And from that, we need to decide where the money goes. And it needs to be based on community initiatives, because there have been places where people have practically been road improvements for years and have not gotten them. Jim Ingle. I believe the question was on road improvements and how we would fund them. The one thing that the proffer uh, change has made is with the $9,400 going to all the roads, that's brought in a tremendous amount of money from the VDOT matching funds. As a matter of fact, I believe Chesterfield County got the second most amount of money towards roads because of the proffer program have since it's been implemented and there's been more asphalt laid in Chesterfield County than there was before um, due to the change in the property. Anyone want to use their wild card on this? Okay, I'm going to now ask a question for all candidates and everyone gets uh, 30 seconds. I'm going to start with Tammy right out. Um, come this way and Jim, you'll be the last. Um, over the last few years, tensions between the Board of Supervisors and the School Board have increased. 
especially over funding for infrastructure and maintenance. As supervisor, would you press for more control and say over school facilities, maintenance, and operational functions? Well, I believe since the county owns the buildings, that it may be a time now where the Board of Supervisors actually needs to control the maintenance of these buildings. Clearly, it's not working with the school board, but we are getting a brand new school board, so that could have changed. However, um, I feel that we should go ahead and take it over, but I still expect the school to not get that money to be used for something else. For, so. So at a new incoming school board, certainly this needs to be discussed and looked at, and I think that uh, we really need to look at how business is being done in maintaining the schools. As, as Tammy said, the schools do belong uh, to the county, uh, but we have to look at what that cost is going to be, how it will work out. You know, do we have duplicate services? So I would be interested in us taking a look at that. I would definitely be interested in looking into that, but also keeping in mind that you want to have a positive working relationship with the Board of Supervisors and the school board. And so maintain a good relationship with both entities so that we can actually get something done. But also, because we do have um, possibly new leadership coming in, definitely wait and see and then just have a conversation and see where we go from there. I think that there's a um, history to show that as the county schools work together and fleet maintenance was transfer transferred under one, umbrella, then procurement, purchasing, and other departments, there has been a collaborative effort that reduces overhead costs and it does function well. I think that there needs to be um, highlight now placed on major maintenance issues. The county has proven we do it well, we do it successfully, and we look forward to making certain that as we move forward working collaboratively that it makes sense to see if we can unite those functions as well because they are all county owned as uh, buildings the citizens own. I think it warrants merit. The challenge you have is not about this board, this working relationship. It's 20 years down the road. And I think people like school board because they expect the school board to solve the problem. The reality is, maintenance problem wasn't made overnight. It was 15, 20 years in the making. And it's because we've had a lack of investment in, in public education here in Chester County. So I want to make sure that the school board has some type of mechanism because parents are going to blame the school board. They see something's wrong with the school board. This school board commissioned a study. We found out what we really dealing with after years and decades of neglect. So I think we have a plan now. I'm looking forward to working with the, uh, the next board uh, in the next uh, January. Bernie. So we are going to have a completely new school board. Once they get into office, it's important to see what, what have the people chosen for their school board representatives and have a conversation with them and parents of students in our schools of where the maintenance functions would best lie. I would be cautious about um, erring towards micromanaging the school board. That being said, maybe the new school board would be interested in that. I'd need to talk to them and see who the people choose. And the discussion would ensue between the school board, board of supervisors, and parents. And I think we can make a decision from there. But we're going to have new people, so we can't just make a decision on this right now. Jim. Well, we've seen the county, as, we, as Leslie said, on vehicle maintenance successfully take that over. And we've seen Parks and Recs do a great job with maintaining the uh, school facilities. So I think it makes sense that it would be more efficient to incorporate the uh, county maintenance and school maintenance together. And I think that we'll be able to see a savings there on maintenance overall that we can hopefully give the savings back to the school board to use uh, resources in the uh, classrooms for the teachers and the students. Yeah. I think it is certainly a discussion that needs to be had because the Board of Supervisors has a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that the funds, the taxpayer dollars are used for what they have been designated for and if the maintenance have, has been neglected in a while we need to work on that. I agree that we're going to have a new school board and we need to all sit down and have that conversation about that. But I think the second part of that question was about operations. I don't think the Board of Supervisors should be involved in dictating what the operations of the school would be. That's the school board's responsibility. Chris? Well, I absolutely agree with that. I, I don't want to have anything to do with the school board's operations. Uh, however, I do think that uh, there is middle ground 
here for discussion on major maintenance. I think as a member of audit finance for three years, what I really saw up close and personal was a lack of contract management and a pervasive lack of accountability uh, in the school uh, division at times as it relates to maintenance items. I would say that I think there does need to be a culture of problem solving between the Board of Supervisors and the next school board. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Just trying to help. Well, this issue I understand very well. Uh, I've worked very well with the school board. Mr. Urbach and I get along very well together. We've done a great job in the Dale District, I must say. Uh, the best of all, both boards, in fact, I've been told. And so I'm not surprised with that. Uh, what, with regard to maintenance, which has come up several times, according to our charter, section 3.5 states that the Board of Supervisors shall be responsible for the buildings. And I knew that years ago, and I've been pushing for that years ago, and I believe it's still important that we oversee that. We see, for example, what happened with outsourced janitorial, SRP, the buses, and on and on it goes. Thank you. We have a, a follow-up audience question, actually, to this. And I'm going to start this one with... Uh, Kevin, and I'm going to move that way around here. Uh, Kevin, do you think the school system is currently appropriately funded by the Board of Supervisors? If not, how would you change it? Well, certainly, I think there have been increases in the school's budget uh, throughout the years. Um, you know, we, we had a downturn after 2008 where the school budget was actually cut. Uh, and if you have followed it forward, you'll see that the Board of Supervisors increased it. Some of it has to do with uh, managing the money within the school system itself. Uh, so it, it really needs to be looked at. Um, and then we have to make a decision on the budget and what the priorities are. I believe that the school board does need more money for teachers, bus drivers, and essential items. And if that means increasing the budget for that, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. If we're going to increase it for something else, that's, I would call fluff, then they need to reprioritize. Yes. Yes, funding has increased every year I've been on the Board of Supervisors. In fact, the problem has been the state has not funded the schools as it did before the recession. So the Board of Supervisors stepped up and funded the schools. And so we must, I think, increase teacher pay. We must increase bus driver pay. That needs to be done. Pushing for that last May, the last, uh, last, uh, also uh, last year I, I recommended funding for preschool, K, preschool, two million dollars that the state failed to fund. We funded it for the supervisor. We funded, and my time is out. <laughs> Chris, thank you. Um, so I do think it, you, know, you have to look at where we are over the last term we have 30 million in new operational dollars 99 million in new capital dollars but we clearly have some things we still need to work on teacher pay is one of them i think we need to work on mental health uh, staffing the inside the schools but there are some basics that need to be uh, really worked on major maintenance is a basic uh, having the buses run on time is a is a basic uh, uh, you know, service that the school system provides and so i, I absolutely think we need to keep funding schools in just okay Yes, I think we need to take a look at adequately funding the schools, and by that what I mean, it should be needs-based, not just based on an amount of money that we designate as what their budget is, and we're going to increase it by this amount. I think the school board and the board of supervisors should work collaboratively together to decide how much is actually needed and try to find stable funding sources to be able to come up with that. We need to do better with teacher pay, we need to do better with school with transportation, and we need to do better with getting counselors in our school. Jim? I do agree we need to properly fund the school system. We need to make sure that we work with the school system to see that they're making sure that they're functioning efficiently. And if they're doing everything that they should do in the right manner, and we need more money to uh, properly fund our schools, then that's a discussion we should have. But we need to make sure that money is being spent properly before we put any more money into the schools. 
So it's really important when addressing these measures to look at funding per pupil ratios and look at them across the state of Virginia. When we look across the state of Virginia, Chesterfield, um, we are very low on the list as far as the funding per pupil compared to other localities. And I can share those numbers with anyone. That being said, efficiency is also always the first priority. We need to look at what percentage of our budget would best be used for schools, but we also need to work with the school board to make sure we have an as efficient process as possible and the dollars are being spent wisely, but it's very important to look at those funding per pupil ratios across the state before making that decision. I don't think the folks want to let people to speak. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so currently our maintenance budget, we have 55 million set aside in the maintenance budget. According to the county administrator's uh, position, we need a 2.5% two, two evaluation, which means we need $70 million in the maintenance budget, which means we have to increase our budget by $15 million just to meet basic maintenance. I think a lot of people want to attack the school system, and I get it. What we've done in four years, we saw SRP, we saw construction. None of our construction projects are coming in uh, behind schedule, and they're coming in under budget now. We knew maintenance was an issue because we commissioned a study. Now we need to fund it. Thank you. So I think there's no question that we have supported education. When you look at this current board, there's been $30 million for the last four years that we have supported in additional funding to education. Now the question becomes the transparency of how those monies are being spent, which I think we're all entitled to. But it's also that question of, you know, where do you look at those deficits? And no one's even talking about things like the compression issue with teacher salaries that, that we've not even heard about that needs to be addressed. Those are conversations we still need to have. Juwan, I have one on this question. Funding for schools, that's, that's just something that's key. We definitely need to make sure that our schools remain competitive, make sure that our teacher salaries are competitive. Our teachers should not have to work two jobs just to maintain and sustain a living. We should, not just our teachers, but our law enforcement and firefighters, if you serve here, you should, be able, you should be able to live here. But one thing, it's different to have funding, but how it's managed as something else. So that is definitely something that has to be assessed. Okay, one final audience question, and then we're going to go to the, uh, your final comment, your final statements. And I'll start this one with Leslie and go around, uh, and then uh, no, I'll go with Shawana and then with uh, many county professionals use their knowledge and skills to develop a comprehensive plan. What value do you see in your comprehensive plan, and how would guide your decision making when it comes to future development in Chesterfield? So our com comprehensive plan by statute actually is revisited every five years, and it's really a guideline. It's a visionary guideline for the county to follow. You know, it sets out all kinds of parameters about what we're looking for, what our priorities are, where we see business growth developing, how we see transportation networks. It puts us in a position to be competitive when we're not only looking at economic development, but also when we're looking to do things like match transportation monies, put ourselves out there and, and attract um, transportation and, and other additional state fundings to our district. As Leslie said, the comprehensive plan is, is our guide, it's like the blueprint. Um, and it should be looked at every five years for the reason this past comprehensive plan review was delayed. Um, when you're dealing with locality like Chesterfield, with the constant growth, that's something that we definitely want to maintain and do our best to make sure that it is being reviewed timely, but also to get the impact, the input and the feedback from our citizens and to also always be data driven. Um, to have our goals in mind, but the, the roadmap that's going to get us there, and to make sure that what we have on paper is going to be something that our citizens are going to be happy with. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the comprehensive plan is, is again, a guideline for our community, right? but our community also has input into what uh, goes into that comprehensive plan, which they had in this last uh, year when it was reviewed. But it is a plan that is used to attract business here, to attract people here. We need to work on affordable housing for people. It's part of what's in that plan all through Chesterfield County. Uh, as our seniors get older, they need places to live. Our youth need places to live. Our police officers, firefighters, and sheriffs and teachers need places to live. And that's part of that affordable housing component. That's part of that comprehensive plan. I believe the, the comprehensive plan is very much uh, similar to when I worked with the Virginia Dental Hygienist Association and the ADHA. We used our strategic plan to 
to determine where our actions were going to be and use metrics to make sure we were on the right track. And the only way we're going to know that is to keep tweaking it and make sure when we have something come up, we need to refer to this comprehensive plan to make sure that we are doing what we're supposed to be doing. And I would like to encourage more citizens to participate in that plan. Jim, thank you. As you know, the comprehensive plan is required by state law. It's done every five years in Chesterfield County. I've done two of them. And it's critical because of the quality of life we experience here in Chesterfield County. Uh, it's so important with regard to affordable housing. Uh, do we have the right public facilities and where are they located? Uh, for police. The first time we put in the comprehensive plan this year, we put in the number of police officers required for a thousand citizens. That's in the comprehensive plan for the first time. Uh, also, where will we grow and how will we have the sufficient water resources to ensure we can grow appropriately? Thank you, Chris. <laughs> so, addressing the comprehensive plan in 30 seconds is just you know, entertaining for me. Uh, you know, I mean, just boil that down in 30 seconds if you could. Let me just say uh, that I'm very proud of the amendments to the comprehensive plan that were made this go around. I think. For those of you who have taken a look, particularly in the areas of economic development and environmental engineering, there's some really, really good things in there, some good, solid detail, and I would encourage you to go take a look at it if you haven't done so already. Thank you. Um, as everyone else has said, the plan is certainly a blueprint, blueprint or a guideline. I did sit in on some of the meetings that were held with the Planning Commission with the review of it, and I actually read it, and it's really a lot to read. But my concern is there's a lot of um, vague things like the county shall, the county will, and not a lot of the county must, and that's one of my concerns because in some of those critical areas, we need to be definitive as to what the county is going to do. So, thank you. Again, the county, blue, the county plan, our comprehensive plan is a blueprint for the county. As you build any project, you're going to need to make necessary changes. So you make the adjustments necessary, um, but the final product should still resemble what the original blueprint looked like. Look, with the comprehensive plan, when there's something in the comprehensive plan that citizens don't like and it comes up in a case, um, it will be told to citizens, well, it's in the comprehensive plan. But when there's a change that's going to be made, and citizens don't like the change, and they like the original thing that was in the comprehensive plan, we're told, oh, the comprehensive plan is just a guide. We need to decide, is it a guide or is it strict? And we need to apply it fairly to all cases. And I will add, when citizens wanted to put more input into the comprehensive plan, a lot of their concerns were not listened to recently. So it's not fair how it's being used, is what I will say. I would associate my, my comments with uh, Murdy's comments. I think that's exact, exactly right. I actually think it should be a guide, and I think we should be clear that it should be a guide. I think we need to ensure that those citizens have a voice, and you have you ensure that by creating meaningful structures to make sure you invite people to the process. Okay, we're, now we're going to move to the final statement, 60 seconds, and I'm going to start on this side now with Murdy. This community... Oh, should I start? You yes. said 60 seconds? Okay. So this community knows me very well. I've been going to these board meetings for the last six years. And you all have seen me time after time. I could list all the cases where I've stood with you, but um, that would be more than 60 seconds. You know I'm going to side with the community when it's easy and when it is hard. I'm not here for special interest. I'm here for people. And you know how I'm going to lean on cases because you've seen, how, you've seen the work I've done over the years. Thank you so much for your time. I want to thank John Tyler, the Chamber, the Observer, our moderator, and all those in attendance today, as well as those watching the video. I hope you learned a little bit about me tonight, and if you want to learn more, you can find out more about me at folkjimengel.com, or follow our Facebook page at Friends of Jim Engel, or you can call me directly. I have my literature out in the uh, lobby, and all my contact information is on the back of it. I would humbly ask you all for your prayers for me and my family and for all of the candidates on this stage during this political season. 
I'm excited about getting an opportunity to work on behalf of the Bermuda District to continue building an even better future for our children in our community. And I ask you to please consider voting for me on November 5th. Thank you. Deborah. We are fortunate to live in a large growing um, county that is truly a great place to live, to work, to raise a family, to have a career, to get a good education. However, we can and we must improve and continually ask ourselves how we can make this community better for everyone. Um, if you elect me as a member of the Board of Supervisors, you will be ensured that you have a representative that understands and serves your needs. I will always listen. I will be a hard worker. I bring a lot of experience and dedication. I've lived in this community for 30 years, and I believe in Chesterfield County. I believe in the citizens, and I think together we can make a great chapter in Chesterfield County. Chris? Thank you, and I do want to thank uh, our hosts and our moderator as well. This has been a great evening. Uh, we're living in a great time in Chesterfield County, and certainly it's been my honor to represent you in the Cloverfield District these last three and a half years. Obviously, uh, asking humbly for your vote on November 5th. We have three fundamental items that we really need to be working on. I addressed them in my opening. Again, I thank the school board and the board of supervisors. Both need to change their working relationship, particularly as it relates to uh, major maintenance. We do need to tackle this item. There is nothing more important than the health and safety our students and teachers and administration in these buildings. Second, we must develop a tangible plan to extend Fowling Parkway to Hull Street Road. Uh, this will alleviate much of the traffic situation at the 288-360 interchange. Finally, we must continue to build on our quality of life here in Chesterfield. Uh, we are, for the first time in 15 years next summer, slated to be fully staffed in the police department as an example, and there are many others. Thank you. Jim. Yes. First, I want to thank my wife, Judith, uh, for 46 years, who's been by my son. And I thank you for your help uh, and your support in everything I've done this past 12 years on the board. And I want to say that you've heard a lot of talk tonight about issues in the Dale District. Dale is doing well. Chesterfield is doing well. And it can do better. It will do better if I'm reelected. As I stated earlier, we have a AAA bond rate, not only for our county, but our utility department three or four in the country can say that. So we must do better. And together we roam the Dale District. I'm excited to say we have a lot of new development, new Kroger's market, a new Beulah Elementary School, $30 million, Dale District. We've expanded uh, at the airport. Uh, we have town bank redevelopment. We have retail coming, upscale restaurants coming. We have bills building in the Dale District. All schools are accredited, but we can do better with reading and other issues. And the list goes on and on. Last person once said, if it's not broken, don't fix it. You know what to do. Oh, Jim Holland on November 5th. And let's continue to grow the Dale District. Thank you. Cameron. Thank you. Thank you, Chamber, observers, and audience for this evening. The Board of Supervisors are the employees of Chesterfield citizens and stewards of our tax dollars. The Dale District deserves a supervisor who will not only be present at all board meetings, but who will appoint a planning commissioner based on sound ethical principles and qualifications. After my election, the search committee will recruit a planning commissioner who prioritizes small business development and revitalization, the keys to their success. I will maintain a transparent agenda by hosting town halls and continue to attend community meetings to understand citizen concerns. I will partner with the business community, continue to participate with the chamber and other business alliances. The diverse community of Dale will have a Cogbo Park, a dedicated senior center, and more opportunities to promote healthy lifestyles among their youth. It will be a safe place to live. My neighbors will enjoy a better quality of life right here in the Dale District. If you agree that Dale deserves better, vote for me, Tammy Rideout, on November 5th. Kevin Carter. Uh, I too want to thank the host and the moderator tonight. I want to thank all of you for taking the time uh, to come down here and listen uh, and certainly uh, furnish with great questions. I have been honored to, to serve you as a police officer for the last 32 years. It's something I was very passionate about, public safety. I want to keep people safe in Chesterfield County. Um, you know, a lot of uh, growth has happened throughout the county. We've had some good things that have happened, Hedrick. Uh, we've, we've got a new 
elementary school going in down in Hedrick, the new fire station going in down in Hedrick. Fowler is working on uh, a trail all along the Appomattox River down there. And we're going to revitalize the train station down there. So there has been some good things that have happened in Hedrick, and I want to continue to work on that. Um, and I do have a website. It's friendsofkevincarroll.com. Uh, if you're interested and you want to find out more information, please go to my website. Uh, I, do, I do have a, a servant's heart. That's why I want to do this. Uh, and I humbly ask for your vote on November the 5th. Thank you. Thank you all for coming this evening. Um, for me, it's just simple. I love Matawaka. I love Chesterfield. When you love something, you're passionate about it. You don't mind putting in the work. You don't mind working with others. You don't mind coming to the table to get the goals that we need to get accomplished. And so I ask that on November 5th, you know, with me, is what you see is what you get. You never have to wonder what I'm thinking. I'm open and I'm genuine and I try to get right to the point. But if you feel in your heart, I ask that you pray that you will feel in your heart on November 5th. I ask that you will vote for me. Thank you. Thank you. I, too, have been honored to serve for these last four years, and I thank not only all the hosts tonight, but all of you for coming out and spending your evening um, talking with us and listening to us. Um, I think it's really important. We talk about transparency, and we talk about listening and hearing from the folks. You know, my opponent has referenced that several times. You know, he was chair of the board when they shut down public comment, and unfortunately, when that time went off, he, they, on the school board, actually stopped the citizen comment. You know, on the Board of Supervisors, we felt that that's what we're there for, and we continue to feel that way. I think we've been very, um, you know, when I came on this board, my real act, my action was to be more proactive in looking what we were doing than reactive, and I think it's really guided and set some leadership standards for Chesterfield. But this doesn't come out with, come without a huge commitment of time. And, you know, I've been honored to do that, but I will say, I think my opponent and part of that relationship has dropped the ball because his attendance rate is relatively equal at about 50% to most of the community meetings and most of the meetings he served on. And I find that troubling to deal with. So I'd ask for your support to continue to serve you. Thank you. Okay. Leslie has personally attacked me. <laughs> I know it's not her. I know it's not her. I know you're under a great deal of pressure from the developers that are funding your campaign. <laughs> yes, we had issues with cooling towers. We disclosed it. We fixed it. It will never happen again. It was beyond disheartening to learn that the county also had issues with Legionella. And they chose to sit on it for two months without disclosing it to the public. Is it, or it was it, or was it not a public health issue? I hate that this has gotten so personal, so toxic. Candidly, maybe naively, when I first decided to run for the seat, I thought it was going to come down to, do you support public increasing funding for public education? Do you support putting more controls on the crazy development happening in the low end? And do you believe the government should work for the many and not for the few? Unfortunately, it's gotten a wild card. <laughs> Unfortunately, the few have decided, the few, the vocal minority, have decided to inform her thinking. With me, you get what you get. I'm 100% all in all the time. I'm in it for the right reasons for our future. I hope you will join me in this fight. Let's, uh, first of all, let's, uh, for the observer and the chamber, thank all the audience coming was fabulous. Uh, <laughs> secondly, having watched people uh, contest for elected office for a long time, it takes an enormous amount of work, an enormous amount of commitment and effort, and so I think we'd like to thank everybody for a real thoughtful discussion. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.